don't waste time. <laughs> Life is not a dress rehearsal. Mm. Do what you love. And if you don't know what you love, do something because uh, you gain self-knowledge through action. Hi, John. Thanks so much for joining me today. Congratulations on your $37 million United States Air Force contract. Before we talk about that, could you take us on the Piasecki story, the journey, starting from your father, Frank Piasecki's pioneering work to your own journey? Thank you, Danielle, for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all the work you're doing to advance hydrogen. Uh, it is, a, uh, I think, a transformational opportunity. And uh, it's a labor of love for a lot of us, and most importantly, you. And I know everything you're doing for the community is, um, it's just a lot. And I know it goes well beyond just uh, uh, business interests, but uh, is a passion for you. So thank you. Um, the story of Piasecki and vertical flight really goes back to the beginning of the helicopter industry. Uh, my father was um, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia was at the time was a sort of a hotbed of uh, vertical lift, um, emerging vertical lift industry because Harold Pitcairn had secured the uh, patents for the autogyro, for the articulated rotor uh, uh, used in the autogyro. And he actually established a company called the Pitcairn Autogyro uh, Company just north of Philadelphia. And, um, and then he had a series of licensees that were local to the area as well. So there was this nascent <clears throat> community of engineering uh, expertise that was building up and organizations like the Franklin Institute, which is a, uh, it's a science museum today, but at the time it had a really active role in promoting technology development and actually even training uh, uh, designers and had a great patent library, et cetera. So Philadelphia at the time was a, a, a major center of industrial arts and those those organic capabilities uh, were, were the you know the the seed or the the soil in which the seed of, of vertical lift really blossomed and um, and so uh, when, when my, was that around what like what decade uh, well this was in the uh, late 30s and in fact I think if you if you go into the history books the sort of pivotal moment um, uh, was the American what well, was the first Rotary Wing Conference uh, uh, of the United States, and it was hosted at Franklin Institute, I think, in 1938 or 39, wow. um, and that's where all of the uh, all the pioneers, uh, including Igor Sikorsky, showed up to talk about the future of vertical lift. And in fact, we have the minutes of that meeting in our company safe. That's <laughs> it, cool. Uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting. So. Um, my dad and uh, a bunch of his um, uh, buddies from the University of Pennsylvania um, did get together after they graduated from college and and they had their day jobs because uh, it was you know early in the uh, the war. And so uh, in the evenings, they would get together and um, design and then ultimately build what became the second successful helicopter in the United States called the PV2. And uh, that's down at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And, and the real innovation of that uh, aircraft um, was the uh, uh, demonstration of dynamically balanced rotor system, which uh, uh, aligned the center of mass and the center of lift of the rotor blade so that the control forces uh, uh, were minimized and it allowed for scaling up of the the rotors to much larger sizes so that helicopters could be more useful uh, machines. I mean, up to that point, uh, helicopters were basically just aerial observation platforms. Um, and uh, the, the demonstration of dynamically balanced rotor system coupled with the uh, invention of the tandem rotor helicopter, where you had two rotors counteracting um, each other's torque, uh, was essential in increasing the, the, the scale and utility of helicopters, uh, particularly because they were dependent on piston engines for their power. And, and piston engines, you know, we're so, all so used to turbine engines today that 
uh, the the poor power to weight ratio of those engines uh, was a real limiting factor. So that was the the birth of the tandem helicopter. And then that company grew very rapidly because it was basically their first product had three times the payload and range of anything out there that was flying. So the Marines used it to explore uh, the whole concept of vertical envelopment uh, and uh, the Army and uh, the Navy um, used it for, for their various missions, uh, just an exploratory um, capacity to see what vertical lift could contribute. And it really opened up um, a whole new industry for the United States. And uh, ultimately, you know, Piasecki Helicopter, I think was the largest helicopter company in the world, that, or certainly the largest backlog. And the DuPonts and the Rockefellers invested to be able to expand its production capacity. And then ultimately, there was a big debate uh, between the founders and the investors over, well, do we do we reinvest in the company and go to the next generation product? Uh, or do we do we pay out uh, the returns to the investors, et cetera? Um, and uh, and so that led to a, a battle uh, uh, between those two groups. Uh, and ultimately, my dad left the company with his original founding group, and they sold the company to Boeing. It became the Vertol division of Boeing. Wow, and I did not know that. Yeah, and dad, uh, dad and his R&D team created the company that my brother Fred and I run now, which is Paiseki Aircraft Corporation. So what, what was the company that your dad, the, that was sold to Boeing? What was the name of that company? Well, it was Paiseki Helicopter and then it became Vertol. And then when it was sold to Boeing, it became Boeing Vertol. Wow, cool, okay. And they, so they continue to produce the Chinook and, and well, a lot more aircraft now, the B-22 and the Apache. Um, so... Um, a great company, and we continue to have a close relationship with them. We shared a lot of DNA. Um, they're literally right across the creek from us. I could throw a, a stone onto their backyard. Um, and uh, we find ways to collaborate on various projects. So uh, it's just, you know, it, the, the, you know, Piasecki and Boeing in Philadelphia, and then Leonardo's in Philadelphia. Airbus was originally in the Philadelphia area, and then they moved to Texas. Sikorsky was in the Philadelphia area as well, out in Coatesville, um, although they've now moved out uh, uh, and we acquired their Heliplex facility. So then um, there's a whole ecosystem of suppliers. I mean, you just don't snap your fingers and create a helicopter industry. I mean, you have all sorts uh, and manner of not just industrial uh, uh, partners, but uh, also academic partners. Um, uh, Penn State is a center of excellence uh, in vertical lift and Maryland uh, uh, plays an important role as well as a center of excellence in uh, Georgia Tech as well. So uh, Philadelphia um, uh, really has a historical um, uh, role in the in the in both the uh, development of the helicopter and in its continued uh, um, uh, production. That, that's so cool. It sounds like. VTOL, or for those non-aviation folks listening or watching vertical takeoff and landing, um, VTOL uh, is is really in your DNA. I would have loved to grow up in your household. Um, for me, aviation didn't really come on my radar until I was reinventing myself in my 30s. Um, so I didn't know any of this. So I just can't imagine... Um, the amazing things that you witnessed and were exposed to as a child and through adolescence um, growing up in that area with your dad doing that. Um, you did say something I wanted to clarify. So you said they continue, Boeing continues to work on the Chinook. Did the Chinook, was that a product of your dad and his friend's company? Um, yeah, the company that that we sold to Boeing um, uh, produced the Chinook and the CH-47 and the CH-46 um, uh, helicopters, both you know mainstays in the U.S. military for decades. I um, did not know that. That is yeah. so cool. I love. I ever people make fun of the Chinook sometimes, but I think it's a pretty cool um, aircraft. Uh, I, I I love the Chinook. It's the What's the term they use for it? The ultimate machine. It's so useful. 
and the yeah. tandem rotor configuration allows it to uh, do a lot uh, that uh, single rotor helicopters can't do. If you yeah, lift, it's it's tough to beat a, a tandem rotor helicopter. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. So, so what led to you be okay? So your dad. So he at night he's working with his friends on this company. They get success, sell to Boeing. Then your dad starts another company, also this one called Paiseki Aircraft. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. then what year was that? That was 1955, I think was the you know founding date. And then um uh you know the they they were uh based originally on the Philadelphia airport and then around the Philadelphia airport and uh uh, have always been, you know, local to this area. Um, the The focus of that company was really on research and development, um, and which was really my father's true love. I mean, it, it, he loved taking problems and uh, going through uh, this wonderfully creative process to c develop innovative ideas to 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 uh, address those problems and then prove them in in flight. And um, he definitely manifested the old adage of uh, every problem is an opportunity. So uh, the focus of the company, as I said, was, you know, the uh, design, development and flight test of novel VTOL aircraft. They did a lot of amazing things. They they built uh, flying cars, uh, a, a product called the Air Jeep, several versions of it. They uh, built the world's first quad rotor uh, drone. Um, they pioneered uh, compound helicopters um, to expand the speed, uh, gross weight envelope of of, of helicopters. Um, they built the uh, a, a lighter than air hybrid lighter than air helicopter aircraft called the Helistat. Interesting, which was. Uh, which was very successful for about three months. And then it had a ground accident and it was an uh, uh, unfortunate demise of that project. Although the idea is still being pursued by various people out there. Um, so, and then, you know, in the, in the eighties, or yeah, I guess it was the late eighties um, when the wall was coming down. My, my father was, um, uh, you know, a, a very patriotic American and, took a lot of pride in his Polish roots. And um, uh, he was a staunch anti-communist. Um, and, you know, we were, we grew up sort of hearing a lot of the stories uh, of, of, you know, what's happened over the years um, with people living under those kind of regimes. And, and so when the wall came down, dad really was very, focused on doing what he could to try to help Poland emerge out of the Soviet system and 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 come into the West. And President Bush, who was a, a pretty good friend of dad's, um, asked him to go over and help get the, uh, a product called the W3A Sokol helicopter, um, FAA certified. So uh, it was one of the first projects that I had the chance to work on and it was really, uh, really interesting because, you know, we were going over to Poland maybe four times a year and meeting with all these um, great Polish engineers who were so excited about, you know, the, the changes going on. And, um, and I saw Warsaw and I saw uh, Lublin and all these uh, cities change so rapidly uh, as they got integrated in, into the West and, and the, and the Polish government was very smart about how they did this. They they sustained a lot of the government oriented, you know, owned industries, these big factories. So people were just shoved out onto the streets. They sustained them, but then they provided incentives to for the creation of new businesses. And by the time we finished the FAA certification, it's Part Twenty Nine certification of the W3A Sokol, um, the rest of the the Polish uh, uh economy um had really overtaken the state-owned enterprises and uh i mean poland's been an economic engine you know ever since 
So it was a lot of a, a lot of really interesting. I witnessed a lot of interesting evolution of um, that that most people don't get a chance to see because uh, they're not in the front lines of that kind of situ situation. So um, that was really a great experience um, that I had because my father gave me you know, the the opportunity. I originally was not planning on working for my dad, which is kind of funny. It's the irony of all ironies. Um, uh, he and I, uh, he and I had talked about it when I was in college. I was like, dad, you know, you've, you've done great things in vertical lift and I love you and I love everything you've done, but I'm going to go in, in, in another direction and, and see what, you know, I can do. What, he, what was the direction that you were? Well, at? I was really, I was a political philosophy major at Yale. And, mm. and, uh, I mean, I took all the science courses, all the pre-med science courses, just cause I love science. Um, but um, the world of ideas was just fascinating for me. Um, and I remember I came home one time and I, uh, to, to announce to him that I was going to be a philosophy major. And he, uh, he said, uh, what are you going to open a philosophy shop? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's such a great example of his very yeah. practical nature. He, um, uh, he was a bit of a philosopher himself, but uh, mm -hmm. he was also uh, the, the, the world's most practical engineer. Mm -hmm. He combined both imagination, creativity, artist, artistry with, you know, very practical uh, uh, engineering um, skills that that um, that would enable the realization of those ideas. So um, <clears throat> I. Um, yeah, I was not gonna. I was not gonna um, work for him, but he had uh, sleep apnea, and he he fell asleep one evening, driving his car, and he slammed in the back of a of a bus, and he was not doing well. So, um, I got the call, and so I, uh, you know, I, I I came to help. And wow. Yeah. So when I did come to help, uh, and what what year I was that? Just, that was eighty nine. So, so when I did come, I, and the more I got involved, the more I, you know, I would engage with primarily the, the military customers, the more I saw that technology was just not getting to the warfighter, not getting to the user. And in many cases, it had nothing to do with the technologies. It had everything to do with the impediments uh, of an acquisition system, you know, um, uh, I wouldn't say monopolistic, but certainly oligop, or whatever the word is, you know, uh, there was maybe three or four major OEMs. They had their products, you know, they had their constituencies and it was very hard to penetrate. Um, and building the same thing over and over and over again is, is, is much easier than taking the risk on, on new concepts. So we, we, we really, took on this role of a bit of a gadfly, I think, in the industry to, to, to push, you know, push, prove things were possible and, um, you know, force advancements in, 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 in the industry. So, and that's both within the industry and within government too. Um, so I think you've seen a lot of change over the past 30 years that have recognized the need to overcome those impediments um, a lot of structural change within the government, a lot of change within the industry. And we now have players that, you know, have nothing to do with the defense industrial com complex. They're all very commercially oriented. They're leveraging technologies at a rate that the big OEM military contractors just aren't capable of. Yep. So it's ex an exciting time. Yeah. And you've definitely done a good job. Uh, penetrating that and accomplishing what you set out to do. Because when I first started hearing about Piasecki, it was probably 2019, 2020. And again, not coming from, you know, traditional aviation background, I thought that you guys were this innovative startup. Um, and it wasn't until like maybe the last two or three years that I started learning more about the history and learned about your dad and, um, Martine, Martine Rothblatt was talking about your dad and I guess she knew him as well. And so I'm like, I, I have to know more about this story. And so you've, you've definitely done that from a newcomer coming 
into this space and seeing what you all are doing, I just saw they're really smart, successful startup, um, not knowing. So it's a compliment to say that it, you didn't have like, it didn't feel like bureaucratic, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah. 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 Um, well, Martine didn't have the chance to, to, to meet uh, dad personally, but uh, she's read a lot about him and, and uh, I she think met your mom. Great. That's what it was. Yeah. She, yeah. she was being awarded um, a um, uh, American helicopter museum achievement award. And then uh, uh, she, her family and uh, her staff kind of actually flew um, and landed at my mom's house. It was great. That's so my, cool. My daughter went out and painted an uh, orange, uh, day glow orange circle, you know, right around the um, the old hello, uh, H that we had had there when we were growing up uh, for landing a helicopter. I mean, to imagine growing up with a, a helipad is is just cool in itself. But then you have your daughter painting a landing spot for Martine is amazing. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah, she what she said was she had enormous respect for your dad and that yeah. she met your mom. Yes, thank you for yeah, correcting me. I have to say that she Martine has uh shares a lot of the innovative spirit that that my dad had and i i think they would have got, gotten along famously um you know there is a certain passion for cre creation that you know it's 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 not everybody has it and but for those who do have it it is the wellspring from which so much good comes to society and uh and you know martin is definitely a great example of that yeah, in fact, um, you kind of took the words out of my mouth because when you were describing your dad and saying how he was innovative, artistic, creative, and I can't remember all of the words that you used, but as you were saying it, I was thinking it's this is exactly how I describe Martine to people. And it seems like the people who really change an industry and then therefore end up changing the world are the people that have this incredible intelligence some like out of this world intelligence and this like intuition for art and also very practical and you know like natural natural born engineers natural born negotiators um you know paired with art is is just really it's very rare it sounds like your dad um was like that yeah it was it was he had the uh the ability to uh, uh, identify people of creativity and bring them together and um, create an environment where, uh, you know, ideas were welcome, you know, new ideas yeah. were welcome. That's cool. So in becoming the CEO of Piasecki, did your mom have an influence on that? Her name was Vivian, correct? Yes, Vivian. Um, and uh, I'd have to say that mom uh, did not encourage us to, to work for dad. She, <laughs> she really wanted us to go and explore, um, you know, our own paths. And, uh, you know, it, it was it, it, when she died this <clears throat> past summer at a uh, at the age of 92 and she she had a great life and you know it was interesting growing up in our household because we had these two very different parents um but very complementary as well they had they shared uh, uh the same values but for as hard charging uh and um uh, pioneering as my father was my my mom was pioneering as well but she did it in a very quiet way, uh, and she brought people together to do uh, new things that the community needed. I mean, she she founded the Gladwin Montessori School, which we all went to. It was originally called the Children's House, and Gretchen and I have sent our kids, and all my siblings, have, not all of us, but uh, everybody who was local sent their kids wow. there um, uh, and had the benefit of a Montessori education. She she uh, she created a, a Sunday school for for um, for a lot of her Catholic friends who were interested in being able to elicit maybe more of a intellectual uh, curious um, discussions about religion, faith. Um, you know, we, we grew up Catholic, 
and uh, and you know the the Catholic Church is not always about debating you know uh, various precepts. They they're more like, well, this is what it is. And I think she saw a need in a in in the modern world for more of a uh, educated uh, educated people to discussing. Um, the ethical challenges uh, uh, where their faith and modern you know, society intersect. And it was more of a thinking person's approach to religion um, than um, maybe maybe typical. Uh, she uh, got she did so many different things. she she was one of the founders of the uh, Constitute Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Um, uh, she was on the board of a bank, Fidelity Bank. She she did a lot of different things. Oh, she was a trustee of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she was um, she was the chair of the nursing school. Um, she was doing things that she felt were important, and she did them quietly, uh, without a lot of fanfare. But uh, you know, I think she she did a lot of good. She was on the board of the public. Uh, uh, broadcasting channel WHYY um, for years. So anyway, anyway, she invested her time wisely, and she she always taught us that that you know from for those who have been given much, much is expected, and she lived that and uh, you know demonstrated those values to us, and she expected the same. But she didn't. She did not push us to go to work at my father's company. He did, but, uh, <laughs> you, but you gave did. me chills uh, when you you said your mom's quote, and I actually hadn't heard of her until she recently passed away. And there was a tribute written about her and it was just beautiful. And I was in tears reading it and I felt like I knew her and um, I could tell that she really cared about people and society. And it was just really neat to see how much she was involved in like you said quietly um not seeking attention for anything but just doing all of the things that she believed in which is also very rare yeah. so yeah it just sounds like your parents um are just amazing yeah it was, we, we were very lucky to 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 have parents um like that and uh, um uh i'm just i'm just grateful about it very sad that she passed away but she had a great life and um and we're we're thankful yeah yeah well said are there other fields or industries or hobbies where you or your family has innovated or would like to innovate not related to aviation well, I think you know, I think hydrogen itself is an area. I know we're, we've we've entered the hydrogen universe through aviation, but um, a lot of the things that make hydrogen a very interesting opportunity for vertical lift also have applications across other sectors of uh, the economy, and so we're looking at a whole bunch of different things. Um, that are synergistic with our work with Zero Avia, and you know the just building a hydrogen helicopter isn't enough. You need an infrastructure to support it, um, and uh, and and it's not it's not as easy as you know just putting another uh, fuel depot at a major airport because helicopters, by definition, operate in a distributed environment, and that's the whole reason why you have vertical lift and um, and so solving the challenge of how do you how do you get hydrogen uh, to the place where you need it is uh, it's not just applicable to hyd uh, helicopters, it's applicable to a lot of different things. Um, other adjacencies, you know, our, our expertise in rotary wing aircraft also applies to, you know, other rotary wing type of applications like wind turbines uh, and. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges with, with wind turbines um, and with wind, wind wind farms or even sustainable intermittent power generation from from solar and wind are are challenges that you know need to be overcome. So 
those are adjacencies that um, that we're 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 looking into, and uh, it, it it's sort of well moves well beyond just helicopters. It's much broader. Yeah. Now that's something that we have in common. I think what you just said defines if anybody says what in the world do you and John Piasecki have in common? It would be that that we entered the hydrogen universe via the channel of aviation. And we're seeing that same thing. You're like, oh, this would work in aviation, but whoa, this has many applications and could solve so many troubles. But yeah, then you come back to, well, how do we get the hydrogen from A to B? And how do we afford it, you know? Um, and how do we keep it from being astronomical prices? I would love to chat more um, about that offline because High Sky is also looking into, you know, how we can um, help sort of, you know, be the buffer in between like where the hydrogen is produced to getting getting it to where it needs to be affordably and clean um, without, you know, emitting emissions along the way. So um, and that actually leads into my next question, which is when when did you personally or Paiseki as a company, <clears throat> excuse me, when did you personally or Paiseki as a company start looking at hydrogen? Uh, we started looking at hydrogen in 20, I want to say 2018, maybe 2019 after, you know, we, we did a, a lot of conceptual work, uh, for Martine, uh, Rothblatt, uh, in uh, assessing the feasibility of, of, uh, electric VTOL, but battery powered electric VTOL. And, um, a lot of that work was done uh, based on going in assumptions and, you know, with respect to battery energy density and, sure. you know, rates of improvement. I mean, helicopters take, you know, five to seven years to develop and certify. So you don't want to, you know, design an aircraft with today's technology in mind. You want to develop it with what you anticipate being out there. So uh, once we get on, got, got beyond the preliminary design stages of that, um, uh, we started digging deeper into the assumptions to make sure that that they were valid, and we ended up uh, uh, in, investigating about well, I think it was about forty different battery chemistries um, uh, that were identified as sort of the most promising. And what came out of that detail, that deep dive, was that the um, improvements in energy density that were projected were not being realized and were not likely to be realized in the time frame that we required. And uh, and then the other really big thing that came out of that was that um, when you subjected these battery chemistries to uh, the VTOL uh, power spectrum, the you know very high discharge rates at the uh, beginning of emission, then level it, leveling out a cruise, and then uh, very high uh, discharge rates at the uh, midpoint of emission, and then with the reverse going back to base, the uh, cycle, the impact of those high C rates on on cycle life was was overwhelming. I mean, it was mm -hmm. we had batteries that went from four thousand cycles down to four hundred cycles. Ooh. Now the impact of that on the economics was huge because we flowed, you know, we flowed through in our modeling, you know, the, the lower cycle life, of, you know, and the, and the cost of the batteries, uh, it really ended up only being about 6% cheaper, you know, under the best of circumstances, uh, than a turbine helicopter. And we're just not going to be able to convince, um, the helicopter operators out there that, it's worth to, uh, giving up a lot of performance because you're not going to be able to deliver the same performance of, of a turbine. Uh, you need a design to provide enough performance, but you're not going to give that up for only a 6% reduction in uh, operating costs. This mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. And, and why take the risk? So um, we started looking into alternatives and hydrogen fuel cells were were an alternative but the a lot of the challenges the weight and the complexity of uh water management systems and the low temperature pem fuel cells that were you know in in automobiles 
became, you know, the, the, uh, became a problem for vertical lift because every pound is precious in a vertical lift application. So we um, we ended up linking up with a small startup called High Point, and uh, we funded them to do some um, mini stack testing, short stack testing of uh, high temperature PEM fuel cell technology. And uh, those test results were promising enough that we um, entered into agreement to, to collaborate. And um, ultimately, High Point was bought by Zero Avia, which was you know, pioneering the application of uh, low temperature PEM fuel cells on fixed wing aircraft, where they, you have a little bit more margin on fixed wing aircraft for, as far as weight is concerned. Right. Um, but Zero Avia uh, uh, acquired high, high Point primarily to advance this concept of the uh, high high temperature PEM fuel, fuel cells that get rid of a lot of the weight and complexity um, uh, that the you know low temp technology has. So uh, we are now in the midst of working with Zero Avi to we'll, we'll do a flight demonstration in the in the coming year of um, uh, a small uh, German coaxial helicopter called the Coax 2D um, that we've you know taken out the IC engine and we're replacing it with hydrogen fuel cell system. That will be, we're hoping the first manned uh, manned helicopter flight with hydrogen power, vertical flight. Very cool. I hope I get um, an invite to that. I would, oh, I yeah. would love to be there. That, that's great. Yeah. Um, what's the most unexpected um, yet pivotal moment in Piasecki's journey into eVTOL? Um, and you may have already said it. It might have been what you just said uh about the batteries but was there a moment that directed the company's path um yeah it was it was the identification of hydrogen fuel cell technology as as a as a way to close the the design loop on a on a viable product you know if you want to introduce um, a new product into a fairly mature marketplace you know dominated by very capable companies with a lot of resources you have to have a disruptive um, advantage, and uh, hydrogen fuel cell, at least on paper, shows that it can it can it can do that. Um, now we're in the business, as we have throughout the history of Piasecki, of of, of taking an idea and um, turning it into real hardware, and then testing the hell out of it. And um, uh, and so that's a great opportunity to be able to do that. And if if it works. It's wonderful. If it doesn't work, we'll uh, we'll look for ways to make it work. Uh, but the the there is no substitute for real test data to, to make you know decisions on. So that's why we're highly focused on this Air Force contract and testing the 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 technology at a full 660 kilowatt you know power level, um, and then running it through the uh, paces. Yeah, and it's going to be a huge advancement for the industry as a whole. Are you guys the first um, hydrogen, like crewed or manned, I guess, crewed or uh, passenger hydrogen aircraft to get funding from the Air Force? Because I can't think of another one. We may be. Um, I really... I really, I'm not aware of anybody else who's gotten funding. Um, uh, they are very interested in advancing vertical, uh, electric vertical flight. I think they see uh, a lot of the realities and constraints of battery, uh, battery powered flight. Um, it's very good for certain missions, uh, but if you want to expand into broader markets or even military applications, um, you're really going to need more energy density to do that. And uh, and so I think that's why they're interested in it. They also love the idea of reducing cost. Yeah. So, well, not to mention, you could also be in the middle of the Pacific and potentially make your fuel right there, mm -hmm. um, which could be a game changer. Yep. Uh, yeah. So could you, speaking of the Air Force, could you briefly describe the Ares project in the PA-890? 
So the Air Force contract focuses on two main thrusts. Um, the first thrust is the Ares uh, project, which is a uh, tilt duct configuration that was originally, God, it was really originally conceived under an Army con SBIR contract um, a number of years ago, but uh, was put forward by ourselves and Lockheed Martin in a competition that DARPA had for a project called Transformer, which was basically a flying car. Um, the novelty of the the mission that we were trying to address was something that could um, launch off of a sh you know a small ship and um, uh, travel uh, a, a meaningful distance and then uh, uh, land in a you know complex terrain whether that's you know in an urban environment or um, you know mountainous environment or what have you where you might not have the um, large landing areas that a large open rotor uh, helicopters um, uh, require. And um, and so that was, a, uh, it was all, the name of that project ultimately changed to Ares for Aerial Reconfigurable Embedded System. And we built, uh, uh, Lockheed was the prime and, and Piasecki was the lead for the development of the air vehicle. Um, and Lockheed, uh, in addition to doing all the responsibilities of uh, the prime for program management and systems engineering, they had the flight control uh, software uh, uh, and computer hardware. So uh, so we were able to develop that aircraft and uh, was out at Yuma and we got about 30 hours of powered ground testing in. We got signed off by the uh, Air Force to proceed to hover flight. But before we could do that, um, the funding in the program had been fully expended. So, uh, you know, Lockheed, to their credit, you know, offered to put in money as long as DARPA put in additional money. Um, DARPA made a decision not to do that. So um, Lockheed uh, shut the program down and the Air Force provided us with the air vehicle Lockheed, you know, have stripped all the software off it, and um, which they had to do for a variety of reasons. And we really started at square one and de developing a new flight control system. And, uh, you know, we've, we established a relationship with Honeywell, um, who is has been developing a triple X fly-by-wire flight control system for a lot of these eVTOL applications. And it's very, you know, very innovative, practical approach where they, it's a layered, you know, software system where they have, you know, uh, validated software that does, you know, uh, functions on the aircraft that are agnostic to the configuration. And then as you travel up the stack, you then get hot, uh, you tailor it to the specific application. And by doing that, they can spread the cost of development over multiple platforms. So uh, if I had to estimate you know, the cost for us to get where we are right now in the program, uh, it's probably one-tenth the cost of a typical big OEM to wow. develop a triple uh, fly -by, triplex fly-by-wire flight control system. So um, now it hasn't flown yet. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but if we're successful, I think that that is a bit of a game changer right there. Uh, it will open up um, some of the significant benefits of fly-by-wire flight control for uh, on a much more affordable basis for um, a VTOL aircraft. Then the other part of the program is this hydrogen fuel cell uh, demonstration. It's going to be a the 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 project goes through a series of iterative development on key elements of the technology. Most importantly, the uh, um, the stack. Uh, fuel cell stack, uh, uh, iterating that, and then um, uh, building a full-scale ground test, what we call an iron bird, um, where we will exercise not, not just the fuel cell, but all the balance of plant. And uh, our ultimate objective is to have uh, be powering a, uh, a full drive system controls, you know, rotor system, main rotor, tail rotor, uh, you know, classic, helicopter Ironbird um, and put that whole system through its paces. 
and that will validate the technology uh, in support of its transition, not just into the PA890, but I think there's going to be a lot of interested eVTOL manufacturers in um, uh, in the fuel cell technology if they want to expand the capabilities of the products. Uh, and it's so interesting. An another uh, first for me is, and if there is somebody out there that has gotten um, Air Force funding to develop a crude hydrogen powered aircraft, forgive me, I'm just not aware. So let me know. But that was the first that I ever heard. Another first for me is I've never heard of like, it's almost like two different initiatives being funded. So was that like two different proposals or were you able to tie it all no, together they're, in they're one? Both the, 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 the proposal, the efforts are related. Um, uh, the uh, advanced flight control technology being demonstrated on the Aries uh, and advanced propulsion technologies potentially uh, you know, can, can transition to um, lots of different VTOL aircraft, including tilt duct configurations. So okay, gotcha. basically maturing these technologies to a point where then they the we've demonstrated efficacy in, in their application and they can then be uh, applied to specific um, specific aircraft. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work that that we're doing under the Ares program that will directly contribute to um, a family of systems uh, uh, that we're um, we're looking to. Gotcha. Okay, so let's talk something non-aviation. What is a passion or interest of yours that most people might not expect? from the CEO of an aerospace or aviation company? Um, well, you know, it's, uh, I guess one of the, one of my biggest passions growing up was music. Um, I, uh, I, I learned violin formally, um, and, uh, and that was a great instrument to, to learn about music and the theory of music. And, um, was a way of uh, actually I was able to teach myself to be able to play other instruments like the piano and guitar wow. with that music knowledge but you know, I, I I can't say that I'm great <laughs> but I, I only have an audience of one that I have to please um, <laughs> and you know I remember in high school just going into uh, my parents living room and turning off the lights and just you know, improvising, I guess, is the uh, what I I love to do. Um, unfortunately, you know, I've I've allowed work to crowd out between work and family. A lot of the passions that I have have, have been subsumed. But my wife keeps on encouraging me to pull out the uh, pull out the guitar, get on the piano, and um, exercise those talents. Yeah, uh, you got to use it or lose it. Um that that makes me so so happy uh i did not i i'm really not able to picture you playing the violin i would absolutely love to see that i don't know yeah. if you've played i don't know i don't know if you'd want to hear it at this point uh <laughs> right. but um it was it was something i really loved uh, growing up and and was a gift you know it was a gift for life um and then getting involved with with uh you know i was on the board of the opera company in philadelphia for years I did read that and I was like trying yeah. to make that connection. So that kind of helps um, yeah. bring it together. I was formerly trained um, on the clarinet and, but that gave me a foundation to teach myself piano. Um, ukulele is my favorite to play. And there you go. yeah, I'm, I'm not great, but I'm, I'm decent. I, I could probably do like an open mic. I haven't. Um, I okay. mostly just play for family birthdays and holidays. Um, I'll definitely be busting it out tomorrow. And I, I can play the guitar a little, but my I have small hands and um I find the ukulele is a lot easier to navigate. Um I don't struggle on the piano, but for some reason the guitar is just really hard for me. Um, but I I do want to get better at it. Um, so that's really cool. Um, yeah, and if you have a piano, because I don't I don't have room for a piano where I'm at, but that is probably my favorite instrument to play. Um, so, well, yeah. my uh, my brother, my twin brother Mike, um, very graciously got me a piano years ago, and and uh, and so it travels. It's traveled 
with me wherever I've gone. Awesome. Um, that's yeah. so cool. Well, and yeah. that's one reason I like to play the uke is because it's so easy to grab and take on a trip, you know? Um, and I did have a piano, like an upright uh, years ago, but it was a pain to, <laughs> to haul that thing around. So I oh yeah. The, 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 what I have is a, a digital, you know, digital piano. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know. I have no excuse for not having one of those. Um, so that's really cool. Um, yeah, we'll definitely have to jam together at some point where we're, we're going to have to make that happen. Yeah. Um, so, okay. so what's your, um, what is, the, what's the wildest goal that you have for Piasecki aircraft that might surprise people that even work at the company? Um, well, I, we are going through, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is a wild, you know, a wild, it's, it's, it's a logical extension of where we are today, but, um, you know, my brother, Fred, who leads is the chief technology officer and, and also the chairman of the board of the company has been very successful in advancing, um, a whole po portfolio of programs from ideas through, you know, practical demonstrations and our biggest challenge as a company historically has been that, you know, doing R&D is not, doesn't close a business case, right? Um, we've been very successful over the years from a technical point of view and, and the company is, you know, debt free and we're, you know, um, we're sound financially, but, but in terms of growth, um, you, we can only uh, grow through the realization or the monetization uh, of our ideas. And so the acquisition of the Sikorsky Heliplex facility really is a major shift for us because, you know, the it moves us out of the pure R&D um, field and expands our capabilities into, um, into manufacturing and production uh, of of the products that we're developing. So um, that is that is a big shift for this company. I mean, my entire life, it's been uh, experimental flight research has been our mission. You know? Ah, okay. Um, so it was, was it like one-offs? Um, absolutely. I mean, we, okay. we build the first of something. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in order to be, uh, I think, sustainable, beyond, you know, Fred and my, you know, tenure at this company, you, you need to have the stability of a product base. And that can be somebody else producing it and the company getting a license, or it can be um, uh, the company manufacturing internal or some combination of those things. But uh, uh, technology that is proven uh, is great. And that is a research mission that we have uh, been very uh, diligent in pursuing, but it really is only sustainable if you can get it uh, uh, into production. Right. Well, I'm learning so much. That's so interesting. Um, okay. Here's a good one. This might be my favorite question I'm going to ask you today. Uh, if you could time travel, would you go to the past or the future and why, and where would, what era would you go to? Hmm. Well, and this may be a biased answer because I'm from Philadelphia, but um, I have always been fascinated by Benjamin Franklin. And if I could just have dinner with him, that would, that would be great because he, you know, like Martine, like my father was one of these wellsprings of innovation and curiosity and, um, and I just love that. So just in terms of intellectual satisfaction, I think uh, getting the getting the opportunity to know him would be would be wonderful. Uh, that was a great. I love how specific you were. What would you ask him? Uh, my biggest question would be a life question. Like, how did you do all of this? Because you can't go a block in Philadelphia without running into something that Ben Franklin, you know, founded, invented, you know, restored or, you know, and, and su across such a breadth of different interests, you know, uh, it's extraordinary, you know, everything from, you know, the, the politics, the important role that he played in the nation's founding to, 
education. He founded the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he, uh, uh, medicine. He, he founded the Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, insurance. He figured out a, uh, a scheme by which people could get their houses insured on an affordable basis. And fire, you know, fire companies. Um, uh, the library, the Free Library of Philadelphia, was uh, founded by him. Um, it just goes on and on. And then, you know, his um, no, to the defense of Philadelphia, he he was led the committee to defend the city. Uh, his humor, you know, uh, his well, obviously his publishing. Uh, he he was, in my opinion, he was the forerunner of the internet with his express mail you know responsibilities yeah. up and down the uh colonies so Good point uh yeah he was like i think our first media mogul um uh so i, I just really found him to be a, a most interesting person at a most interesting time uh in our country now there's a plenty of other times in history that i would love to have been you know, a fly on the wall. Um, but, but, but Ben Franklin is a pretty, pretty good choice. I think. Yeah, that that's really cool. And I always find it interesting when I ask that question to people, because some people are adamant about wanting to go to the future. Like I would a hundred percent want to go to the future. I wouldn't be able to narrow down to one person that I wanted to meet. Cause it would be so, <clears throat> it would just be too hard to pick. Um, I just would love to go to the future, but yeah, it's like one, one or the other, you know, um, nobody ever says like, I want to go to both. Although I didn't give you that option, but, um, nobody says that. Okay. So, if well, you I could... don't know where, go you ahead. know, the, the future is, it's so dynamic. I wouldn't even be able to establish a location <laughs> to go to. I mean, right. You know, that would be I'm my too... fear is like, I go somewhere into the future that like doesn't exist and yeah. I'm like stuck there in like nothingness and I, I can't get back. Um, yeah, my, the, my, uh, my kids, uh, my kids give me, um, a lot of grief because I'm, I'm just fascinated by ancient cultures. You know, the, the Roman, uh, the Roman empire has been, a, I've, I've read through the whole decline and fall of the Roman empire, like three or four times. It's, uh, an incredible read, but, uh, uh, going back to sites and, and I don't think most people really appreciate how advanced some of, some of our forebears were. I mean, uh, and then it also makes you appreciate that you can lose it too. You know, civilization. Why, you why did it. the Roman Empire fall? If if you could summarize it briefly, I'm so curious what your take on it is. Well, uh, the. I think the the most important thing was that the integrity of the of the empire, um, the idea of what it was to be a Roman citizen over time, was degraded, mm. um, and it factionalized, and you know the, uh, I, I I think you know, Gibbons would have, you know make the argument that the invasions from, you know the German, um, uh areas and well i mean just the, the whole empire was surrounded by by different uh uh, uh foreign in, uh invasions that you constantly had to be pushing out and i think internally you know there was this fundamental shift between um the roman republic uh uh and then the roman empire when uh, augustus caesar took over and and the restorative aspects of republic uh the accountability that that system had in maintaining a uh, healthy governance was lost and so in a lot of ways leadership within the uh within the roman empire was degraded and um corrupted Mm. Um, it still lasted a long time, but it was, uh, it had to survive, um, major downturns and, and, you know, there was, um, there were some amazing people that did lead, uh, that were good people, but there was also a whole bunch of bad actors that, 
put their interests ahead of the empire's interests, et cetera. So uh, I think I think you have external uh, forces that are a constant pressure on the empire, and then the ability of the empire to withstand those forces was degraded by basically a corruption of the republican form of government um, in in the empire. Oh, interesting. I could ask you about that. Oh, that's another conversation for another day. Okay, if you could go back to younger, <clears throat> a much younger John Piasecki, what do you tell your younger self? Um, don't waste time. <laughs> Life is not a dress rehearsal. Mm. Do what you love. And if you don't know what you love, do something because uh you gain self-knowledge through action and um and so uh sitting 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 and pondering what you want to be when you grow up um isn't going to do it you got to go you go you have to act and by acting you will gain knowledge and then you can make good decisions there's nothing you can't recover from um and you'll be better off because you will know what you like or dislike even if it's a bad experience um and I, I sort of the corollary to that is to always take advantage of opportunities that that uh, that come forward. I mean, it, it, I was blessed with a lot of unique opportunities, and I'm I'm so grateful to have had them. Um, but uh, you know, I feel like a lot of people are just they're in their comfort zone, and they don't they 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 don't have the experience to be able to understand what they're missing. So, yeah, um, who, if you could recommend, by the way, that was brilliant. Uh, life is not a dress rehearsal. I'm committing that one to memory. Um, well, I can't I take that. credit for that. There was a, there, that, that somebody else said it, but it, 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 it is a great, it's a great rule to live by. Well, I think it was Seth MacFarlane that said great art good artists create and great artists steal <laughs> and i'm pretty sure that he stole that quote so i think it's fair game that i can say that it's your quote um <laughs> <laughs> so yeah who would who else would you um recommend me bringing on this podcast um well, Joe Ben might be a good person to bring on i know that he's interested in in hydrogen um and he certainly is the leading, uh, you know, Joby is the lead, got the lead in the eVTOL sector. Um, so I think that that he would be worthy. Um, Val Miftikoff might be a good person, um, the CEO of, uh, yeah. of uh, Zero Avia. Both um, fantastic recommendations. Yeah, yeah. And well, you already great. got 15. <laughs> Yeah, I've got Martine and I'm going to get Martine back. I have to finish reading. She gave me homework. So I've got to finish reading um, Jazz of Physics, which I don't know if you heard her tell me about that book, but you should also read it. Um, yeah. Oh, well, after your podcast, I went and bought it. And, cool. Uh, you know, he must have sold 30 or 40 copies after that podcast, because I know a few other people that bought it, too. I'm about halfway through it and it is really cool. Have you started it? No, I haven't. I've got. I've got a stack of books that I just keeps on getting taller. Me too. <laughs> I'm like, when the apocalypse comes, I I, I know what I'm doing. I'm reading <laughs> <laughs> when we lose internet. But but yeah, I actually have been reading that one. Um, I, I have to read it so I can get her back on. But yeah, John, if you don't mind, when we end this, um, I just have two quick things that I need to mention after I stop the recording. But um, thank you so very much for your time with us today. I learned a ton about you. My goal was to learn more about who John Piasecki was away from Piasecki Aircraft. And I think we definitely accomplished that. Are there any last words you'd like to leave our listeners or viewers with? Um, well, I just uh, appreciate all that you've done. And uh, and I'm so happy to be working with uh, my brother, Fred, who's you know the uh, really a creative genius. Um, as the chief technology officer and his teams are doing great things. So I feel really blessed to be trying to push the envelope with, uh, with great people. And, uh, and I'm very thankful for that and uh, appreciate all you're doing. Well, thank you. I'm very thankful for you and your team. And 
um yeah with that um i'll see you on the other side don't okay hang up. don't hang up thanks daniel